O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 71, beginning at the first verse. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been as a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off at the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed. With scorn and disgrace, may they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually, and will praise you yet more and more. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The word of the Lord is found recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, the 20th chapter, beginning at the 28th verse. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord is found recorded in St. Paul's letter to St. Titus, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, 
so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is found recorded in the Gospel of St. Luke, the tenth chapter, beginning at the first verse. After this, the Lord appointed seventy-two others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. St. Titus was a bishop in the early church, training up pastors for congregations in Crete. 
On this feast day, the church recognizes that Jesus sends pastors to his church so that his church may flourish and share in the full blessings of Christ. Those blessings are primarily the blessings of the sacraments, Christ's death and resurrection, which we share in when we are baptized, and the feast of Christ's body and blood, which joins us all together as one body. But this evening, I would like to talk about a less obvious blessing that a faithful pastor brings to a congregation, sound doctrine. In our epistle lesson for today, St. Paul admonishes Titus that when he is appointing pastors for the church, he must seek out men who hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Verse 9. Now, when Paul is speaking here about sound doctrine, he is speaking of healthy doctrine, if I could rephrase that. Now, we occasionally use the word sound in this way. For example, if I were to go and sign a will, I would write, I, Jonah Laws, being of sound body and mind, unhealthy doctrine makes unhealthy churches, which is why God sends pastors equipped with healthy doctrine to make us healthy people. For a meditation this evening, we must first examine the relationship between doctrine and practice, and then we must examine how good pastors are to teach healthy doctrine and rebuke those who teach and live against healthy doctrine. Now, first, we've got to begin with something that is a little controversial. Doctrine and practice are inseparable. When we try to separate God, Christ's word and discern what are the essential parts and what are the non-essential parts, when we try to figure out, well, what do we really need to do versus what we, eh, we should probably do, what we really need to believe and, you know, what we might believe if we you know felt like it if we do that it's it's not going to go well for us now to give an example this would kind of be like throwing away the instructions on a bottle of med medication it's all just theoretical you say to yourself what really matters is actually doing something with the medication but a few hours later you would find yourself in the back of an ambulance driving to the hospital to get your stomach pumped. It really did matter what those instructions said. The doctrine really mattered. Or to give another example, suppose you were to read several books on CPR. You went to a class, you got certified. But the moment when your neighbor was choking next door, you stood by and did nothing. You knew what to do, but you did not act. This is what it is like when we read about doctrine, but it does not have any effect on how we live or how we pray to God. Now in the church, we have a lot of healthy practices. For example, we meet together for the divine service, which delivers Christ's gifts to us, his word and his supper. Now the rite itself teaches us what is taking place. For example, when we sing the Sanctus in preparation for the Lord's Supper, this song teaches us to believe and that, that God is present with us at his table in Christ's body and blood. A holy meal is being given, it's being hosted by the most holy God to people who have been made holy by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. This song reminds us and teaches us about this reality and prepares us for the Lord's Supper. What we believe and teach in the church informs how we act and live. If we believe that Christ has paid for our sins, died and rose from the dead, and that we cannot die now, how does that change how we live? I'm not making that up. That's what the Apostles' Creed says. 
This is why it's important that pastors believe God's words. They are not only supposed to teach God's word to his church, but the pastor is supposed to be an example to Christ's church, especially to the younger men, which we will see in Ch Titus chapter 2. Christ's teaching is healthy for us. But Satan's lies will poison us and tear us apart. Because of this reality, Christ has sent pastors for the purpose of teaching healthy doctrine and rebuking those who teach Satan's lies as virtues within the church. The lies of Satan will tear a church apart if Christ's word is not used to slay them. It's really interesting. The word of God is the only offensive weapon we are given in the armor of God as Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 6. The pastor is most especially given this weapon for the difficult task of cutting away the sick doctrine that Satan whispers into our ears when we are not listening to God's words. Scripture not only teaches us who God is and that he has saved us, but it also teaches us how we are to live in this world because Christ has redeemed us from sin. Paul goes on to explain in Titus chapter 2 that healthy doctrine teaches us how to live in the church and in our families. I would recommend reading Titus later this evening, but let me summarize chapter 2 for you right now. In this chapter, Paul tells Titus that in the Christian congregation, older men are to be mature Christian men who serve as faithful examples to all. Older women are to be mature Christian women who are sober and abhor gossip. Older women are also given the special task of instructing younger women to become good wives and mothers. The young men in the congregation are encouraged toward Christian maturity by the pastor's example. All of these actions, these things that we do in the church, flow out of the reality of God's grace toward us in Christ our Savior. As Paul continues to explain in verse 14 of chapter 2, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. With these words, Paul teaches us that Christ's sacrifice that saved us from sin also bought us back. We are Christ's own possession. And being owned by Christ means living how he teaches us to live not how Satan or a sinful flesh wants us to live. They do not own us anymore. Christ owns us. This is where the pastor is confronted with a task that is never fun but is necessary for the health of the church. In order to be healthy as a church, the pastor must rebuke those who live and teach contrary to God's word. The pastor must expose unhealthy doctrine and practices in the church. He must also call us to repent of sin. For example, consider what Holy Scripture teaches us about marriage, the family, and the Sixth Commandment. That one man and one woman are joined together in marriage as one flesh. That the husband is to love his wife, sacrificing himself for her, as Christ has sacrificed himself for the church. Consider that the wife is told to submit to her husband, as the church submits to Christ. Children are told to honor their father and their mother. And we are told that the estate of marriage cannot be torn apart in divorce without serious consequences. Because again, in marriage, we too are made one flesh. Satan has spent several generations attacking these truths with vigor. 
He has been trying to make us question these words of God because we so often hear them made fun of by our pagan neighbors. Now, Satan will not win this war. As we clearly learn from the rest of Scripture, but if we were to believe the lies which Satan tells us in place of sound doctrine, then Satan may win the fight at this congregation. If the pastor does not work to expose and confront these lies and sin, we will grow sick. We will suffer, not because we are clinging to Christ's words in the face of pagans who don't believe them, but because we ourselves have abandoned them. Now, God does not abandon us. He does not leave us to constantly wonder about the state of our salvation or whether we're believing the right things about him, but he has placed men in the church to rebuke us of our false doctrine, to call us to repentance for our sin to encourage us to live in righteousness and to exhort us with God's word. This is so that we would all be able to live together as the body of Christ, receiving his gifts and hearing his word until our final day. Healthy doctrine actually prepares us for the day when we lose our physical health and when our eyes close on the last, for the last time. It is at the deathbed that a lifetime of healthy teaching from our Lord's word from the pastor will sustain our souls. This healthy doctrine will give us the comfort that Christ eagerly awaits us. And it teaches us to trust that even when our bodies are buried into the ground, they will rise again with Christ. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve us to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We confess together our common and saving faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Because your steadfast love is better than life, 
my lips will praise you. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, you call Titus to the work of pastor and teacher. Make all shepherds of your flock diligent in preaching your holy word, so that the whole world may know the immeasurable riches of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.